Good morning. Uh, I thank the organizer for inviting me. Even though I'm, I think I'm one of the organizers, so uh, I thank myself uh, also. Uh, yeah. So uh, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Actually, it was the second time in this year that I was uh, here, huh? which means that I like Natal. And, uh, now, uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, quantum metrology, quantum sensing, and uh, give you some general uh, introduction first. And, and uh, then tell you about some uh, uh, experiments that have been done recently uh, uh, with my participation. Uh, so the idea of this talk is the following. First, I'm going to introduce some general concepts on quantum metrology. Then I'm going to tell you about, uh, some, about an experiment that involves quantum metrology in phase space. Uh, which, wa which is used, was used for sensing small electromagnetic fields. And then I'm going to tell you about theory that we have developed at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro uh, in order to deal with open systems. And if there is time, I'm going to tell you something more on, on, uh, on uh, the quantum speed limit. Now, so what about parameter estimation? So parameter estimation is the central point of quantum metrology the central aim of quantum metrology. And uh, it, you could be interested, for instance, which is fashionable here in Brazil, to find out the depth of an oil well by using, say, sound waves uh, that probe this depth, so by measuring uh, uh, how much time it takes for the sound wave to come back. And for an by analyzing the sound wave, you can have a, an idea about this, this uh, oil uh, 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 at the bottom of the sea. Uh, you might be interested in estimating the time duration of a process uh, or weak forces or small displacements uh, or yet phase displacements in interferometers, uh, which, which is, of course, uh, important for the LIGO uh, observatory or even transition frequencies. And I think a very nice example is this one made by the group at NIST, uh, led by David Weiland where they uh, actually were able to uh, estimate the shift in frequency of two clocks, actually two atoms, uh, which were uh, in different heights at the surface of the Earth. So uh, the difference in height was 30, 30, 33 centimeters. And because uh, these two clocks are in a gravitational field, that implies uh, displacement of the frequency, which was measured with a precision of 10 to the minus 17. Okay? So these are some examples of parameter estimation. And in fact, in the 21st century, parameter estimation has led to many, many uh, experiments. These are some examples of experiments in this area. Uh, phase resolution, for instance, uh, in several kinds of, of, of systems, using entangled photons, uh, multi-photon entangled states, uh, and so forth. Uh, That's it. Passou? OK. Oh, it's, it's okay. Atomic clocks, of course. Let's see how many. It's funny because there is some delay here, which is a new thing. I've never seen this before. Anyway, yeah. So f f uh, phase resolution, as I mentioned. Uh, atomic clocks, magnetometers, uh, distance and tilt of, uh, of Mirrors, for instance, uh, small shifts of distance in an interferometer. Again, with LIGO, that's an important thing to measure. Uh, or yet, uh, very weak, very small tilts of mirrors. And here, you see that even the patents related to that. This is a patent for uh, precisely measuring absolute distance and tilt. Uh, Steve Walburn, in his talk today, he's going to talk about uh, quantum enhanced sensing of, of a tilt of a mirror using hyperentanglement. That will be the talk in the afternoon. And today I'm going to tell you also about this experiment, which was made at Collège de France, uh, which involved the measure of a, of a small microwave field amplitude beyond the so-called standard quantum limit. So many, many uh, possible uh, applications of this idea, and in fact, many experiments have been done related to that. My aim today is to present you some conceptual foundations of this area, 
but also to present you some experiments so that you can see how, how these things are actually measured in practice. Uh, and this gives us some idea of what, indeed, this quantum metrology framework is good for. Now, I am go also going to stress some conceptual facts related, say, to the Heisenberg uncertainty relations, and which help us to clarify the meaning of, uh, say, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, there is a kind of Faraday uh, effect here. Anyway, so the meaning of, for instance, of the time energy uncertainty relation, or even the meaning of the number phase uncertainty relation, which has been discussed in the literature, and I believe quantum metrology helps us to understand this in a much better way. Uh, so, uh, of course, you may know that uh, uh, this poses some problems because you don't have a time operator, uh, so it's not in the same foot as the uh, position momentum uncertainty relation, and the same holds here. Uh, if you want to put it in the same foot as the momentum uh, position uncertainty relation, you, have to, you should have a phase operator, and there are problems defining a phase operator. Now, uh, so quite generally, parameter estimation in classical and quantum uh, physics involves the following steps. First, you prepare a probe in a suitable initial state. Then you send the probe through some process to be investigated. It is a parameter-dependent process, and you want to estimate the value of this parameter. Then you have this final state of the probe uh, that depends on the parameter to be estimated. You choose a suitable uh, measurement, and then you associate incremental result, say J, with some estimation of the parameter. Now, uh, this field owes a lot to these three guys, Kramer, Rao, and Fisher. In fact, Kramer and Rao showed that the uncertainty in the estimation of some parameter X is bounded below by this expression, where n is the number of repetitions of the experiment, and f of x is the Fisher information, which is defined by this expression here. It's a funny expression, it's not the entropy, huh? and we are going to see the geometrical meaning of that in a while. Uh, this pg of x is the probability of getting an experimental result j if the value of the parameter is x. Uh, so this is the expression that uh, determines this bound, lower bound for the uncertainty. For continuous measurements, you replace this expression here by an, an integral, uh, which is equivalent to that one. And Fisher sh actually showed that uh, this expression can actually be saturated when the number of, of repetitions goes to infinity. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a saturable uh, bound. Now, Quantum parameter estimation has, again, the same steps. However, there are some uh, tricks. The precision in the determination of the parameter depends now on the distinguishability between quantum states corresponding to nearby values of the parameter. So, it is possible, that's the question we are going to formulate, is it possible to get a better precision for the same amount of resources by using some special quantum states. And I mention here the word resources, and I must define it, and that's defined in each case. So resources may be, for instance, the number of atoms in atomic spectroscopy, the number of photons in optical interferometry, the average energy of harmonic oscillator, and so forth. Okay, so in each case, we have to define precisely what are the resources. So that's the question when one answer in quantum metrology. So let me give you an example of this. And the example is in optical interferometry, and I'm going to go back to this uh, example very often in this talk. So you have some interferometer here, and you want to estimate this phase in the interferometer. Now, the standard limit says that the uncertainty in the estimation of the phase should be proportional to 1 over the square root of the average number of photons used in this experiment. And here I have ignored that factor square root of nu, which, is, which stands for the repetitions of the experiment. Now, uh, we can get this result by looking at the uh, scalar product between two coherent states, 
representing, say, this field that is used to measure this, this phase, one which is a coherent state alpha, and the other is a coherent state with a displaced phase. Now, this scalar product here is given by this expression, and for sufficiently small uh, delta theta, you can approximate this by this expression here, and you see that if delta theta is of the order of one of square root of the average number of photons, this goes as one over E, so that's a measure of distinguishability, say, of the two states. And so the states start to become orthogonal, and that means that you can actually differentiate this state from this one and detect this, this, this difference in the phase. Okay? So that's the idea. Huh? You must be able to differentiate these two states. So it's, it is really the distinguishability of the states that comes in into, the, uh, into this expression here. Now, can you do better than that? Well, you can. You can, for instance, use the so-called noon states that were introduced in atomic physics by David Wineland and, and after that in, in photons by Jonathan Dowling. So the state is a state like that. You have n photons in the upper branch or in the lower bunch, lower branch. And in fact, this state is a coherent superposition of the two possibilities. And now you see that if you have a phase shift in the upper branch, this state becomes this state here. And you see that there is this factor n that comes in together with theta. Now, if you want to differentiate this state from the previous one, you should look at the scalar product between them. And here, I just replaced theta by delta theta. So this scalar product is very easy to, to calculate. It's given by this expression. And you see that the two states become orthogonal when this argument here is equal to uh, pi over 2, which means n delta theta equal to pi, that is delta theta of the order of 1 over n. Uh, now, that's quite different from what we get here. So this is the so-called Heisenberg limit. And you see that, indeed, the precision is better from the same amount, for the same amount of resources, which are, in this case, the average number of photons in the state. And the average number of photons in the state is equal to, to n. So uh, here it's one n, here is one of square root of n, so uh, we get a better precision. Okay? So that shows that quantum states can actually help us to increase the precision, just because they become orthogonal to each other uh, for a smaller variation of the parameter. Now, let's try now to make this more precise by introducing the quantum Fischer deformation. Now, the quantum Fischer deformation is actually the same as in the classical case, so it's just given by this expression here. However, this probability of getting some experimental result psi if the value of the parameter is x is now given by the quantum mechanical expression in terms of the density matrix of the probe multiplied by some operator here, which quite generally is a POVM. So it's a, uh, in a simple case, could be just a von Neumann projection operator, operator general it's a POVM. And in fact, if you look at this expression, this corresponds to a given choice of this POVM, that is, to a given quantum measurement. Now, the ultimate lower bound for this precision is obtained by optimizing this expression over all possible measurements. In other words, I want to maximize it over all possible measurements in order to reduce this lower bound for the uncertainty. And this defines the quantum Fischer information. It's the maximum of this expression for all possible measurements made on the system. And this is the so-called quantum Fischer information. Now, there is a very geometrical interpretation of the quantum uh, which can be expressed in terms of the so-called Buhr's fidelity. So that's the fidelity between two states, row 1 and row 2. It's given expression. Now, for pure states, uh, this expression simplifies to a well-known expression, which is this one. It's just the magnitude square of the scalar product between the two states. And this is generalization for, for mixed states. Now, if you take this and you find now the fidelity between rho of x, x value of parameter, and rho of x plus delta x, which, is, which involves a small displacement of this parameter, and if we expand this with respect to delta x, you find that the expansion is given by this expression. And look here. 
in this delta x square term, the second order term in the, ex in the expression, the quantum Fisher information shows up. Okay? And that gives us immediately a geometrical interpretation of the quantum Fisher information. You see, it is related to this distance, if you want, between the two uh, states. Yeah? Uh, and since this is a delta x square, the quantum Fisher information shows up multiplied by delta x square. You can see that that the square root of the quantum Fisher information divided by two is just the speed of separation of the two states as you change the parameter. Okay, it's you, I have to take the square root here because you have delta x square here. Okay, so this is speed of separation. So that's the geometrical interpretation of the quantum Fisher information. Okay? And that's very useful for several possible applications. Now, if you look at this definition of the quantum Fisher information, you know, it looks like it is hopeless to get the quantum Fisher information. Come on, you know. You should maximize this expression over all possible measurements. No, that's a nightmare. However, if you have pure states under a unitary evolution, then this quantum Fisher information has a very simple analytical expression. So suppose you start with some initial state of the probe of zero, and this state then evolves uh, into this other state here under a unitary operator. Now we can show that in this case, the quantum Fisher information is given by four times the variance of an operator, which is give, expressed in terms of this unitary evolution. And if but this you can actually consider to be as the generator of this transformation. Okay. For instance, if u of x is given by this expression here, so that it's, uh, it's an exponential with the exponent linear in the parameter, and this operator is independent of x, it's easy to show from this expression that h in this case is just given by O, so which is the generator of this, of this displacement of, of, of the parameter, if you want. So... Uh, so th this was derived by Hellstrom in 1976. And if you have this expression, it means that the lower bound of the for the parameter, the ultimate lower bound, is now given by this very simple expression, where you find here the variance of this operator, which is the generator of the transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, if you look at this expression here, you immediately see that you should maximize the variance to get a better precision. So you should, you should choose the state, the quantum state, so as to maximize this variance here. Now, let's go back to the optical interferometry now, before I analyze it in a kind of intuitive way, look at the separation between the states. So let's apply now the formalism that I have just shown you. Uh, if you have an optical interferometer, Placements, if you want, is the number operator. So the quantum Fisher information now is given by the variance of the number operator in the upper branch of this interferometer. And you see from this equation here that the variance that delta theta, the, the, the uncertainty in the estimation of the phase, is given by one over the square root of this quantum Fisher information. So immediately you get this expression here where delta n is just the square root of the variance, and you see that this really looks like the phase number uncertainty relation. However, the phase here is not an operator, it is a parameter, and that's the sense in which the phase number uncertainty relation should be understood. Okay? So we don't need a phase operator in this case, because we just consider that phase is a parameter which should be estimated. Look uh, how that if you use this uh, quantum Fisher information method, we find that delta theta is bounded below by this expression using, say, a coherent state, because for a coherent state, the variance is given by uh, the average number of photons. So we get this expression here, which differs from the expression before by a factor of two. Remember that before, I had delta theta equal to one over the square root of the average number of photons. Now I have, I have an extra factor of two, which means that if you use the quantum Fisher information, you get a precision which is better than the previous calculation. We might wonder why. Of course, one idea would be to say, well, you are using a different metric. No, that's not the physical reason for that. 
You see, before, we are, we are trying to estimate the phase by comparing the coherent state with displaced phase with a coherent state without this displaced phase. So we are comparing two coherent states with the same amplitude. And this calculation shows us that a, meta, a better measurement is possible. So we might wonder which one. Well, you know, just use an intense field. Compare this coherent state with an intense laser field, which is the so-called local oscillator. So do a, a, a homodyne detection in order to detect this phase. So you see, sometimes this calculation actually gives you a hint that you could do a better experiment in order to estimate this phase better. Eh? And that accounts for this extra factor of two. Now, we, of course, as or we can increase the precision using known states. And again, we can do the same calculation that we did before, but now using the concept of quantum Fisher information. And we find the variance of the state is given by this expression here, n squared over 4, which gives me immediately, using this expression for the quantum Fisher information, the delta theta is bounded below by 1 over n. So in this case, our previous estimation was OK. We get the same result, and we, sh we see again that precision is better for the same amount of resources. Okay, so that's, that's an, an example of the use of the quantum Fisher information. So now I would like to tell you about some specific uh, uh, metrological uh, ap uh, application, which is to uh, estimate uh, displacements in phase space. So you might consider that this is a phase space for a field, for an electromagnetic field in a cavity, say, and you displace it somehow. I'm going to show you how. And you want to estimate this very small displacement. So in order to do that, let me first define you some, some concepts that we are going to use afterwards. So suppose you want to measure small displacements in phase space, say. Uh, you have a system there is some known input state psi. Here is assume that it's a coherent state, so it's a kind of ball in the in the in phase space. I'm not going to be more specific than that at this moment. Displacement transforming x into say x plus lambda. Uh, and, and I'm very happy about this animation. You know, it, it took me it took me more time to do it than to write the content of the slide. Actually, uh, I hope you appreciate it. Uh, and, and now we want to infer lambda yeah, with minimum error from measurement performed on this displaced state. And the displaced state is given by this expression here, where P is the momentum operator, huh? is the space displacement operator. Now, if one uh, measures uh, x, then the precision determinant of the displacement is limited in this case, just intuitively, by the width of this wave packet, right? That's, that's the uncertainty in the estimation of x. Uh, and if you have a coherent state, say in phase space, uh, properly normalized, I would say that the diameter of this uh, coherent state is, is 1. Huh? If you want to talk about p and x, it would be h bar. Huh? But p is 1. Huh? And, 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 and that's the limitation. So for a coherent state, then delta x is equal to 1. Now, uh, that's for, measurement, for measurement of, of displacements in space. For measurements of angles, we can use this result, in fact. You see that we have uh, certainty is determined by this uh, uh, diameter here, which is equal to 1. And this limits the, the precision in the estimation of this angle of rotation. So delta theta, you see from this geometry there, that delta theta is given by 1 over the amplitude of this coherent state, which is square root of the average number of photons. And this is the so-called uh, standard quantum limit. So the standard quantum limit for displacements is equal to 1. And for, the, for angles, for rotations, is given by 1 over square root of n. OK? So if you want to go beyond this displacement, you should do something to the state. And that is shown here, again, with some fantastic animation. Huh? Uh, and using the quantum Fisher information notion. So uh, I have this initial state. I want to it, applying this momentum operator. I know that the, the generator of the displacement is the momentum. So the quantum Fisher information give, will, be give, is, will be expressed in terms of the variance of the momentum. And this will give me some uncertainty, some lower bound in the uncertainty for the estimation of x, uh, which is given by this expression. Now, I want to get better than that. 
So for a coherent state, of course, uh, this uncertainty will be equal to, will be bounded below by one over the number of repetitions, and this is the standard quantum limit. Now I can do better than that by using a squeeze state. Uh, of course, if you use a squeeze state, so you increase the variance in the momentum, uh, then you have better precision, and you see that this expression confirms that if you increase the variance in momentum, you do get a better precision, okay, a better lower bound. So that's, that's the general idea. However, we can do more sophisticated things in phase space, because by using squeeze states, I'm able to measure with more precision displacements in this direction only. What about measuring small displacements in any direction of phase space? So in order to do that, we could use this idea of Wojciech Zurek, which was published in 2001, you use this funny state here, which he called compass state. It's a coherent superposition of coherent states like this. And uh, this is a Schrodinger cat with four uh, feet, like you know, normal cats, uh, actually. Uh, and, and, uh, no, nothing strange about this. So, and you know that there are interference fringes that come up. Uh, so, uh, you have interference fringes here, but here, between, just in the middle of this, uh, this plot here, you see this checkerboard pattern. Uh, and what is interesting is that if you displace a distance which is uh, of the order of the size of this checkerboard uh, uh, pattern here, the, of the elementary cell here, you get a state which is orthogonal to the previous one. Okay? So that means that this small displacement can be identified. Uh, and in fact, the displacement here, you can show that uh, the, the typical magnitude of this displacement is given by 1 over the magnitude of the coherent state. And since this is smaller than 1, you immediately see that you find a precision which is better than the quantum standard limit, right? which would be 1, huh? the, just the diameter of the coherent state. Okay? So uh, that would be a way to explore phase space within a cell which has a size smaller than h bar, huh? typical size. Huh? The, so, that's the cell that in statistical mechanics you say that's the elementary cell, right, of statistical mechanics. And you can actually probe what happens for displacements smaller than the elementary cell in phase space. So that's the idea. Yes. Yeah, for the usual cut state, that also happens, okay, but only in one direction. And I'm going to talk about that too, okay? So the advantage of this is that you can displace in any direction and have this precision. But of course, this state is tough to produce experimentally. So the experiment was made with the usual cat state, the poor cat that has only two feet. Okay? Now, so uh, the, I, the, I, the method of actually using this kind of state to detect small displacement was discussed in this paper, uh, Zurek and Fabricio and Diego uh, Dalvit, Fabricio Toscano and Diego Dalvit. And there we propose a method to measure this. And only very recently, these are typical you know, time scales for experiments at Collège de France. Uh, so 10 years after this, an experiment was done uh, uh, using these ideas and even uh, uh, changing them a little bit. So this is in this paper. You know, uh, here you have, for instance, for small displacements. I'm going to, to look at this plot here. So you have this uh, uh, cat here. This is the original. This is a state with a small displacement, just to make it orthogonal to the other one. This is the product of the two states. You see these visuals blue and red. Uh, and if we integrate this so that you find the scalar product of the two states in, 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 the, in phase space, the two Wigner functions, these are Wigner functions, huh? then you find that it's equal to zero. So the positive regions cancel the negative contributions, and you get zero. Okay? So a small displacement of this pattern, of the order of this, of the size of the checkerboard pattern, produces another state which is orthogonal to the previous one. Okay? So that's the idea. So uh, now we would like to do, this uh, to do an experiment on that. And in order to do that, we use just the usual Schrodinger cat, huh, because the other one is more difficult. So it's a proof of concept for some, sm for some special class of displacements. So we use a cat, uh, which in free space, that's the Wigner function of the cat, it can be expressed like that. And of course, this means that we are going to detect displacement in this direction here, the direction of the interference fringes. And again, 
if we make a displacement of the order of this uh, 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 small dip in, 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 in the dip in the interference fringe, this state becomes orthogonal to the previous one. So we get orthogonality for a displacement given by that, which is beyond the standard quantum limit. So I'm going to describe to you now the experiment. And the idea is the following. So we have here a cavity, uh, which is a very good cavity. Uh, the damping time of the field in this cavity is of 65 milliseconds. That's the frequency of the mold in the cavity. This is the waste of this mold, it's about six millimeters. And then you send through this cavity an atom, which is in a Rydberg state. Actually, it's a circular Rydberg state. Huh? It's a uh, principal quantum number equal to 51, and angular momentum equal to the maximum possible angular momentum, which is n minus 1. Okay, so it's a circular state. Huh? And, and you send it through this cavity. The, there is a resonant interaction with this cavity. Uh, the atom is sent into the higher lying state, which is has n equal to 51, and there are transitions between this higher lying state and the lower lying state, which corresponds to n equal to 50. I call it G for ground state, even though it's not the ground state of, of, the, of the real atom. The speed of the atoms is 250 milliseconds, so uh, some experimental data, you know, I'm a, I'm, it does, may not look like, but uh, I'm a theorist. Huh? But <laughs> anyway, I think we should learn also some, some of these things. And this is the profile of the field in the cavity. It's a Gaussian, actually, so the, at the atom sees a Gaussian in the cavity. But you, you turn, we switch the, the atom uh, in, in, the, in, in a resonant interaction at some time t1, and then you switch off at time t2. So we can actually control the time of interaction of the atom between the atom and the field, okay? by switching the atom on and off resonance. Uh, also, the field to be measured is injected by means of this microwave uh, generator here. Uh, so this, it injects some, actual, some field that can be described by coherent state in the cavity. And this field is injected at time t equal to zero, huh? when the atom is already inside the cavity. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, the reason why you have a coherent state being injected is, is because you know microwave generators are like classical currents, and classical currents produce coherent states. Okay, so uh, uh, the, at the atom cavity coupling uh, has maximum duration of 42 microseconds, while the uh, lifetime of the atom is much larger than that, so you can actually neglect the decay of the atom. Okay? It's, of the order of it's, it's of the order of 30 milliseconds, okay? because yes, these are big atoms. So we inject this coherent state then, then into the cavity. So that's the idea of the experiment, but there are also some, some, some other tricks, which are the following. So again, this is temporal variation of the atom cavity coupling. But you see that something happens here in the, at, at, at the zero point, which is precisely the time when the field is injected into the cavity. And at this point, you take the atoms out of resonance. You take the atom out of resonance in such a way that now the interaction between the, the excited state and the cavity mode is a dispersive interaction. It's not resonant anymore. Okay? So uh, when this happens, then this excited state acquires a phase shift because it's a dispersive, dispersive uh, interaction. So it's like, it's like a refraction index. Uh, and, and so you have a phase shift. And this phase shift is such that it induces uh, a pi phase shift between E and G, which means that this kind of interaction between the atom and the field in the cavity acquires a minus sign. Okay? Sigma plus is just... EG, so if you have this relative phase, you get a minus sign here, a minus sign here, so you change the sign of the interaction, and this corresponds to a time inversion of the evolution. From this point on, you are going to invert the, 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 the evolution that you had before. So this idea was in the paper I mentioned with Fabrizio Toscano and, and, and Diego Dauda. So that's the idea. 
And let's see now what it does to the field and the atom. So this is a joint plot. Huh? I have here phase space for the field. Here you have a coherent state. And you have here the block sphere for the atom. So the atom is injected into the excited state, in, in the excited state. And the excited state can be expressed as a sum of two states, which are expressed like that, the plus state and the minus state, which, if you want, are eigenstates of sigma x, okay? in the equatorial plane of the block sphere. So I just express it in this way. So this, is, this plus state, this is the minus state, equatorial plane of the block sphere. Uh, and this is the initial state. Now, we let the state evolve. So this is at the moment of I turn on the resonant interaction, and this is at t equal to zero, precisely the instant when I'm going to inject the field to be measured. Can show, one can show that if alpha is sufficiently large, the evolution of this uh, system here is a funny evolution. Uh, you get an entanglement between the atomic state and two coherent states. Uh, this state is defined in this way, but you know, don't mind about the, the mathematical expressions. It is like that. So uh, you get uh, this coherent state entangled with the state psi minus, and this coherent state here, displaced downwards, uh, rotated downwards, uh, is, 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 entangled, is associated with the state psi minus. So this is an entangled state between field and atom, and, and, and in fact, if you follow this evolution, do, say, uh, spectroscopy of the atom after it leaves gravity, if you do just that, you find that, you know, the moment the two coherent states get separated, there's no coherence between the two atomic states anymore, huh? because they are entangled with the atomic uh, state. So in this case, you don't get Rabi oscillations of the atom anymore, huh? because, you know, there is no coherence. And in fact, you see that as the time of evolution increases, so the two coherent states get separated, you first get Rabi oscillations, and they, they dump out. And of course, if you continue so that these two spheres get together on the left-hand side, you again will get Rabi oscillations, okay? Because you have coherence between the two atomic states. So that's the idea of the evolution. And now, for a more detailed description, we have this situation. So we start with a coherent state, the atom in the excited state. Then the system starts to evolve. Uh, here we get an entangled state between field and atom. And now I inject the field. So the field will displace these two coherent states in phase space. The same displacement. Beta is the amplitude of the coherent field that is, being, that is injected. It's a microwave field. Uh, so the states become like that. And at the same time, you do the time inversion. Uh, so now, instead of opening up this, the, the two coherent states, they are going to get together again. Uh, so they get together again. And we can show that process, if we detect the ground state, uh, the, the probability of that the, the, that the atom in the ground state or in the lower level is given by this expression, which depends on beta. Uh, it depends also on this distance between the two coherent states. Okay? So you see that by detecting this probability, you get information on beta. Okay, so that's the idea. There is also something nice here, because uh, see that uh, this is just area of this region here. Uh, uh, 2D times, times beta. So this is just geometric phase in this process. Uh, you start with the two together. Uh, uh, you go like this. And now you go back, so you have this area here, which is a geometric phase. So, in fact, this is a measurement, if you want, of the geometrical phase, uh, which gives me information on the parameter, which is the amplitude of the field that is injected. Okay? Okay? So that's the idea. This idea was applied at Collège de France in other experiments, like detecting very weak fields with ribbed atoms, also using the concept of geometric phase to detect the weak fields. And now what do we do? So we have this expression for the probability of detecting the atom in the ground state, uh, uh, which depends on beta. So we put that in the expression for the Fisher information I showed you before, which depends on these probabilities. And then I calculate the Fisher information from the experimental data, okay? because this is, this, this is measured. Okay? Here I have the analytical solution, but you know, 
they measure these probabilities. Huh? So I get, therefore, this Fisher information from the experimental data. Okay. Now, what about the quantum Fisher information for this, uh, for this process? And I'm interested in knowing that. But I can, I can know if, if this method of measurement of, of a beta is the best one. Huh? Here I have just the Fisher information, which perhaps is not yet maximized for the best measurement. So what is the quantum Fisher information in this case? Well, it's very easy to calculate, because you see, I actually have a displacement in phase space. And the operator that produces this space is given by this expression. Uh, if you want, this is the momentum in terms of A dagger and A. Uh, and the generator is given by this expression, so immediately I get the quantum Fisher information. It's given by this expression here. It depends on this distance D. So that's the quantum Fisher information. It's nice because it does not depend on beta. Okay? It's independent of beta. So if you have that, then I can look at this expression and find how it behaves for different values of d. If d is equal to zero, the two coherent states, you know, you don't, don't have two coherent states, just one. So that would be the quantum Fisher information for a coherent state. And then you just get that the quantum Fisher information is given by four. And that gives me the standard quantum limit, which is one half in this case. Now. Uh, the maximum value is for the maximum distance between these two coherent states, which is e given by 2 alpha, and this is equal to 16 alpha square, and that's the Heisenberg scaling in this case. So, so the, the, the interesting thing about this experiment is that things are easy to calculate, okay? And I can compare the experimental Fisher information with this uh, quantum Fisher information. Now, let me show the uh, experimental results. Uh, in fact, what we showed theoretically and after that experimentally is that the measured Fisher information approaches the Fisher information limit for large enough values of this distance here. In fact, the difference is below 1.8% for e larger than 2. Okay? So that shows that the, the measurement conceived by the experimentalists uh, is actually a very good measurement. <laughs> okay? So it leads to, to something very close to the quantum Fisher information. And here are the experimental results. I think they are very nice. So here you have the uncertainty is the estimation of the amplitude of this small microwave field. Here is the distance between the two coherent states, which depends on the interaction time huh, between, the coherent, between the atom and the field. And the corresponding interaction time is given here, but it corresponds to these distances here. So this lower curve here is just the quantum Fisher information that I, sh that I showed you before. Okay? It depends on the distance between the two coherent states, and the expression is actually very simple. So that's the uncertainty defined by the quantum Fisher information, the best you can do. This is the theoretical Fisher information obtained from experimental data. Okay? So it's... Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, not, forget about that. It's not obtained from, from the... It's obtained from this expression here. Where is that? Obtained from this one. Okay? So you take this one, you plug you plug into the, into the expression for the, the Fisher information, which depends on the probabilities, uh, and then you get the theoretical Fisher information. Okay, so you have the theoretical Fisher information, you have now the quantum Fisher information, uh, uh, and you have the experimental uh, uncertainty, uh, uh, which, which you compare now with the theoretical Fisher information and the quantum Fisher information. Now, this line here corresponds to the standard quantum limit, which I mentioned before what you would get for just a state, not for the superposition, which is in this case is equal to 1 over 2. And these are the experimental data. You see that the experimental data, as you increase the distance and it becomes larger than 2.5, say, uh, you get below the standard quantum limit. And in fact, the experimental data approach the quantum, uh, the, the quantum lower limit, uh, the Heisenberg limit. Okay? So this is a demonstration of the use of these quantum states, these interference fringes, to get a higher resolution in the estimation of a small microwave field that is injected into the cavity. Possible application, calibration of the microwave generator uh, using this kind of method. Okay? So that's just an example of the use of quantum Fisher information, the actual experiment which is done to, 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 to probe it. Now, all of this, all all I have told you is for 
pure evolutions, right? Which is very nice. Eh? You, have a, you have an analytic expression for the quantum field information, uh, can calculate easily in some cases, like this one, but you know, nature is tough for us. Huh? You have losses. Huh? And, and, and then losses make things more complicated. For instance, if you take the noon state huh? in an interferometer, the loss of a single photon transforms this state into actual mixture of this state and this state here. Okay? So, in, in the loss of a single photon occurs in a time, which is the dumping time, say, of the system, divided by the number of photons. So, it's a very short time. So, this state is actually very unstable the moment you have a loss, even if it is a very small loss. So, we are interested in analyzing these cases. And, of course, we don't have simple analytical expressions for deficient information in this, in this situation. For small and more robust states than the noon state can be numerically calculated. This has been done by, by many groups. However, there at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, we came up with an idea of finding bounds for the quantum fission information, actually uh, uh, upper bounds for the quantum fission information for noisy systems. And the idea is the following, and I believe it's to be familiar with the quantum information people here. So we have this system here. You have an environment, and, uh, and, uh, and then you do some purification, uh, not in the spiritual sense, but in, in the mathematical sense. So you, you consider the whole system, system plus environment, and then you know that the evolution of this whole system now is unitary, right? Because it's, it's a closed system, so you close the system. And then you can see that the quantum fission information for the system is obtained, as I mentioned before, by maximizing the fission information over all possible measures made on the system alone. Okay? So you don't do anything to the environment and just measurements on the system. And this should be smaller than the maximization of the fission information, of this fission information, over measurements made on system plus environment, just because you have more freedom. Right? You do more other kinds of measurements. Right? So you have this inequality here which means that if you calculate the quantum fission information for the whole thing, and now we have a unitary evolution, so you can use the expressions we had before, this should be an upper bound for the fission, quantum fission information of the system alone. Okay? So that's the idea. Now, uh, so the physical meaning of this bound is that, is that it represents the information obtained about the parameter when S plus E is monitored. And, of course, we are interested in least upper bound. So, interested in minimizing this upper bound over all possible unitary evolutions, because then we are sure that we are getting closer to the quantum fission information of the system. So, again, uh, it's a heck of a problem, right? I mean, we have to now not only to invent several measurements, but also to look for several environments. Uh, and they are mathematical environments. Uh, this is you know, this extension does not have anything to do with real environments. You may start with a real environment, you have a non-unitary evolution, but then starting from the non-unitary evolution, imagine any environment you, you, you want, as, of course, with the requirement that the reduction, the reduced evolution is the, the evolution you had before. Okay? So there are many environments that satisfy that. So we should minimize this of all unitary evolutions. Now, we show in this, in this paper that is mentioned above that this bound is attainable. In fact, we have shown that there is always a purification such that this bound here coincides with the information of the system. So problem, find it. Okay? Find it. But it's good to know that it exists. Huh? Mathematicians love that, right? It's an existence theorem. Okay? Anyway, so physicists don't like it very much because you know, it's, it's difficult to find it. But anyway, so that means that you know, in this case, monitoring S plus E use the same information as monitoring S alone. Right? You don't get anything else by monitoring S plus E. That's the physical meaning of this result. Okay? There, there exists an environment such that if you monitor the whole thing, you don't get any extra information. Right? But that gives us a clue about how to get this environment. So we should try to build an environment where somehow we erase the information on the parameter 
for joint measurements of S plus E. Okay? And that's the clue we use to find nice environments. So let me go back again to the lossy optical interferometer. Uh, oh, that time is decreasing, so you know, suspense, you know, it's like, you get me nervous about that. Anyway, so you have now an interferometer here, and you have some uh, dissipation, uh, photon loss, and uh, the convention I adopt is that if eta is equal to 1, then there is no absorption. If eta is equal to 0, there is complete absorption. Okay? Now, so how can we build an environment which takes into account this? Well, one idea is to use a mirror here. Uh, and this mirror has the same effect on, on the interferometer, right? It takes, gets, takes some photos away from this photo flux. So uh, it is a way of, of, of taking into care this, this, uh, this, this photo loss in a mathematical way. Huh? Okay. So uh, you get this environment now, which is this uh, photon flux, which is associated with this photon flux. And now the idea is to put some refraction material here, huh? which produces some phase displacement also in this branch of, 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 of the environment. Huh? And we should choose theta prime so as to minimize the quantum fission information of the whole thing. Because you see, the whole thing is now time. It's a closed system. I'm measuring environment plus system, and I have some parameter here which I can change. So I have transformed this into a variational problem. And the idea is, is this. So first calculate the quantum fission information of the whole thing. It depends on theta prime as well as of theta. And now find theta prime, which minimizes this quantum fission information of the whole thing, hoping that then this upper bound of the quantum fission information will get close to the true quantum fission information of the system. So that's the idea. And by doing that, we find this nice expression here. Remember, this is the upper bound for the quantum fission information. And this means that the uncertainty in the estimation of the, of, of the phase will give it by 1 over the square root of this, so basically this expression here. And, and now this expression is nice because you can analyze it in two limits. The first limit is the low dissipation limit. Say, when at is equal to zero, at is very small. Quite generally, when this term here is much smaller than this, this uh, term here, so at is equal to one, I am sorry, so it's the low dissipation case. And, and then it's easy to see that in this case, this upper bound of the quantum fission information is given by four times the variance of the number of photons, which is precisely the quantum fission information we found before for the uh, unitary uh, interferometer, for the closed interferometer, without dissipation. Okay? So that's nice. This upper bound that we found here goes into the uh, quantum fission information for the noiseless system. Now, in the high dissipation limit, so that means that it's going to be close to zero, much smaller than one, then now this term is much larger than this one, and then we get uh, this bound, this lower bound for delta theta is given by this expression. You see that this bound now is proportional to one over the square root of the average number of photons. So that's the quantum standard limit uh, with some constant uh, in front, which depends on the dissipation. Okay? So this expression gives me the two limits, the Heisenberg limit and the low dissipation limit, and the standard quantum standard limit in the high dissipation limit. Uh, we have calculated this in a special case for states with a fixed number of photons, because then we can get a, a very simple expression. So that's the uh, lower bound for delta theta in this case. And again, you see that uh, it goes into the two regimes I mentioned before. So uh, for uh, low dissipation, this goes to 1 over n, which is Heisenberg scaling. For high uh, dissipation, this goes into the standard scaling, which is proportional to 1 over square root of n. Uh, from this expression, you can also see that n sufficiently large, the quantum standard limit behavior is always reached, independent of the dissipation. Okay? So if you increase n, you get to this quantum standard limit. Now, this is some numerical... Uh, calculation we have done, comparing this quantum upper bound for the quantum fission information with the quantum fission information itself. Of course, 
since this is an upper bound, this ratio here should be smaller than one. I take the square root because I'm interested in the bounds for the uncertainty, which is proportional to the one over square root of the quantum fission information. So uh, this is the result for this ratio for several values of n. Remember, we have here uh, states with finite number of photons. And you see that uh, uh, for several uh, values of n, this ratio is, of course, smaller than 1, but always larger than 0 0.8, which is very good, actually. Okay? So we have the error is 20%, so it's not that bad okay? for, for our quantum, for this bound of the quantum fish information. Uh, and in fact, we have here analyzed numerically for several values of n, and we show indeed that the minimum of the expression goes to 0 0.8 as n uh, goes to, to as n becomes larger and larger. So that's an example of a calculation of a bound, a lower bound for the uncertainty for noisy systems. Okay? Uh, in some cases, we can find actually exact bounds, and we have done that in several examples, and we're going to mention that in a while. Now we have uh, 3 minutes and 45 uh, seconds. Uh, so uh, during this time, I just want to mention to you very quickly uh, some conceptual point also, which relates to the time energy uncertainty relation. Um, famous relation. Uh, it, is, uh, it was shown, I believe, for the first time in the famous high paper on the uncertainty relations. You have here this commutation relation between energy and time, which we now know is not correct. Uh, you don't have a time of period. You cannot have it. That was shown by Pauli. So uh, that's where it showed up, I guess, uh, the first time. Uh, this uncertainty relation was also present in a famous discussion between Einstein and Bohr uh, on quantum mechanics using a very sophisticated device. Which, by the way, this is, uh, design, was designed by Bohr because the point of view of Bohr is that in order to discuss quantum mechanics, you should actually think about the real measurement apparatus. That's why I mentioned to you the experiment which was done at Collège de France. Okay? But anyway, so that, that's a famous uh, 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 uncertainty relation. And, and this uh, relation was actually derived more properly by Mandelstam and Tam a long time ago. Uh, uh, Anna Dunn and Yaharonov uh, considered also the geomet geometry of quantum evolution and generalized the... Uh, expression of, of Mandelstam and Tam, but also always for unitary uh, evolutions. And, and in fact, what we have done, uh, Marcio Tadei is here? Huh? Oh, he left yesterday, okay. So I, I can, I, now I can tell you bad things about him. Because he was, he's very good. I mean, he, 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 that's his work, huh? his thesis work as a student of, of Queen Nematus Filho. And the idea is how can we generalize these ideas for non the processes. For instance, we, we should be interested in dealing with the lifetime for decay processes. And if we do that, the Hamiltonian should not show up, huh? because it's, it's a non-unitary process. So how, how do we deal with that? We should not have the energy anymore. In a, in a, in a, in a have, we should have something else. And maybe you're already guessing what is this something else that we're going to have instead of the energy. It will come up shortly, huh? uh, just before um, I, um, my, my time explodes and, and I go to some, uh, uh, I don't know, some water pool with uh, crocodiles or something like that. But anyway, so what's the motivation for looking into this problem? First, foundations of quantum mechanics. And in fact, this uncertainty relation between time and energy was the subject of several discussions between all these people here. Okay? Uh, tough discussions, uh, very tough discussions. Uh, you know, these people are not always very kind, huh? especially when they discuss about physics, but I think that's a, the normal procedure. Now, it is another motivation is to uh, calculate computational times. For instance, the time taken to flip a spin, and that's related to the quantum speed limit. Okay? Uh, another problem is the quantum classical transition. You, could, you would like to maybe calculate the decoherence time in a more precise way. Huh? Uh, control of the dynamics of a quantum system. So we might be interested in finding the fastest evolution, given some initial and final states, 
and some restriction on the resources, for instance, the energy or the general structure of the Hamiltonian. Yeah? Again, the, this, this relation would be interesting for this purpose too. And of course, in my own view, uh, a motivation is the relation of all that with quantum metrology. And I'm just going to flash to you the result we have got, thanks to the work of, of uh, Tadei. Bruno Escher was my thesis student, and Rui Nematos Filho was a collaborator, constant collaborator there at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, frequent collaborator. So that's the expression we have, and that is, believe me, the generalization of the time-energy uncertainty relation for non-unitary evolution, so open system dynamics. So here you have, again, remember the Buhr's uh, length, the Buhr's diversity, the Buhr's, the Buhr's fidelity, and this arc cosine of the square root of the fidelity is the so-called Buhr's length of the geodesic connecting the initial state with the final state. So you see rho of zero is the initial state of the system, rho of tau is the final state of the system in Hilbert space, uh, and then you find the geodesic connecting these two states. Okay? Uh, of course, take into account the, the, the Hamiltonian, I mean the constraints uh, the, the, on the evolution, not only Hamiltonian uh, constraints. And on this side, you have the quantum Fisher information. Remember, I told you that, that the geometrical interpretation of the quantum Fisher information is that it is the speed of evolution of the state. Right? So it's quite natural that it show up here. Here is precisely the speed multiplied by dt, and what this is saying is that the length of the geodesic between the two states, that connects the two states, is smaller or, at, or equal at most uh, to the actual path followed by the system, which is given by the speed times dt integrated from zero to tau. Okay? Trivial relation, uh, and that's the geometrical meaning of delta e, delta e, delta, delta t. Okay? It's, it's just a relation between these two things. Now, it looks, it looks uh, strange. Uh, now, this gives you, of course, the lower bound, because time is here, the lower bound for time needed to reach some fidelity. Given, oh, this is rho of tau, huh? between initial and final state. This should be rho of tau. Huh? And uh, I'm going to throw this away after this talk. So, uh, and, and let's see now how, how it goes to the usual results, say the resu result by Haronov of Mandelstam and Tam, in some special case. So let's consider now some unitary evolution, time-independent Hamiltonian, and orthogonal states. Uh, so if you have orthogonal states, the fidelity here between the initial and the final states is, is zero. Okay? And, 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 uh, okay. So uh, we have then in this case the following situation. So this fidelity is zero. Uh, so uh, the quantum feature information in this case is have unitary evolution. And a time-independent Hamiltonian is given by this expression. Now I have h bar square here. I have everything that we must have. Uh, and, and therefore, by replacing the quantum Fisher information here and, and, and understanding that arc, that arc cosine zero, arc which has the cosine zero is pi over two, right? Cosine of pi over two is zero. So we replace this by pi over two. We get now from this equation, this expression here. And this is precisely the Mandelstam term expression. Uh, the time duration multiplied by the uh, uh, square root of the variance of the energy should be larger or equal a to h over 4, okay, which is precisely the Mandelstam expression. Okay, Mandelstam term expression. Okay. What's that? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so this is the generalization of the Mandelstam term equation, and we have applied this to several situations. Since my time has expired, I'm not going to, to go into the next slide. I'm just going to jump this slide and go to the summary. Uh, so what I have shown you is a general framework for the estimation of parameters in noisy systems based on, ex on the expression of Fisher information in, in a purified evolution, that is an extended space. Uh, this from framework allows analytical calculations of very good bounds on the limits of estimation. And in fact, we have obtained bounds for optical interferometry, uh, not only noise optical interferometry, which I showed you, but also for phase diffusion, atomic spectroscopy, 
minimum evolution time, several examples, uh, exact quantum power bound for estimation of force or noisy harmonic oscillator, and so forth. So there is a nice range of problems where this can be applied. And I would like to finish by showing you pictures of, of collaborators in the area of quantum metrology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So uh, these were all uh, uh, say former students. This is an actual student of Steve Walborn. Uh, these are former students, my former student, my form also these two former students. Bruno is now a professor at the Federal University. Márcio Tadei was a student of Huine uh, Lima, uh, Huine Matos, a and these are colleagues at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, who have been involved also in, in this field. So uh, uh, well the clock has not exploded, but it's uh, in zero. Thank you for your attention.